be mindful that we encourage participation. So if you have something to say or you want something to share, please do not hesitate to unmute yourself or utilize the chat box. I will be, I will be scavenging the chat box and, and looking through the chat box for responses or questions. Um, right next to that is the, is the visual, the stop video. Um, and, if you, and again, we understand with background folks are parenting as well and, and just some issues that you may want your camera off. We totally understand that. Um, as we break into breakout rooms, we, we would totally appreciate it if you can um, have your video. As, as well, again, I will also be in the chat box with, um, being mindful that we have so many folks in the room. If there's comments, commentary, responses, questions, I'll be through the chat box again. Um, so please, let's utilize the chat box and I encourage the chat box. Great, thank you so much, Miguel. So our agenda for our time today, um, we did some welcome and introductions. We're going to hop right into a definition of culture and cultural responsiveness. Um, then we're going to do some work um, around understanding ourselves and uh, think about some things to consider. Um, we're going to give you a framework for relationships. And then last but not least, review some strategies to create culturally responsive relationships. Um, I see a question, is it being recorded? It is, absolutely. Um, so we will make this available to you afterwards so that you can review it or share it with colleagues. And then a note on the agenda here, you see the things that are underlined, understanding ourselves and strategies to create culturally responsive relationships. We're going to put you in breakout rooms for those sections. And and that's where if you know for um, you know if you would like to use your camera and, and be on screen those are the two moments that I'm going to encourage you to do that when you're in a smaller group with people um, it's totally optional but I know I like to know when I'm going to be on camera and so those are the times that we would encourage you to turn your camera on so you can see your your colleagues in the breakout room and then our next slide So our session goals today, we want to examine experiences that have shaped our identities, assumptions, and worldview, identify cultural knowledge gaps, and understand the effect that it has on our work, um, define terms related to cultural responsiveness, and develop an action plan to increase our capacity and skills in that area. Next slide, please. And so one thing I do want to say before we hop into our icebreaker, which I'll ask you to participate in the chat, this training is typically about a four to six hour training in person. So we've condensed a lot and made some adjustments for a virtual um, session. Um, I also want to note that just, um, you know, this is a training around a specific lens of cultural responsiveness. You may have heard the term cultural competency, cultural humility. Um, and, and while racial justice, um, while specific populations are very important, and that's work that we've done in other areas, and you may have done in other areas, we're specifically going to be looking at a lens for how we approach the work to build relationships with young people. So I want to make sure people understand what this is and what this isn't, what we're hoping to give you for this hour and a half, and we'll certainly have resources afterwards um, that you can, you know, lean on if you want to learn more about specific topics, specific populations, specific cultures that you might be working with. So with that said, for our icebreaker, uh, I want to ground us a little bit in our experiences of relationship. And so I'm going to ask you in the chat box, if you mm -hmm. so um, can and, and care to share, think about when you were a young person, right? And think about the relationships that you've been in. When have you felt the most affirmed in those relationships? What, who was the person, right, who made you feel like I belong, I should be here, I deserve to be here, I want you to be here? What was that experience, right? And what did that person do specifically? So if you're thinking about, you know, your time in school, your time in after school or out of school time programs, it may have been in your church or in your community. I'd love for people to just in the chat share just some details and you might just share the qualities and characteristics that that person had or the things that they did that made you feel like you belonged. Um, but I, I would love for folks to reflect on that and, and if a few people could share, that would be great. So you can type that in the chat box. 
again, you know, telling my own story, I'm thinking about when I was in fourth grade and my mother insisted that I go to Mrs. Underdue's class. She was the only black teacher in my school. Um, and so one, just by seeing her being there, right? Representation, it matters. And, and having someone who, you know, looks like a member of my family teaching me. Um, she also made sure that, um, you know, the materials in the classrooms, we had diverse books. Um, she was honest with me. She held me accountable. She connected with my mother and my family very well. And so I felt like I belonged in that classroom um, and that I deserved to be there and learning with the other kids. So if folks could share that. I'm going to mute. I think I hear a little bit of sound. So I'm going to go ahead and mute all. Make sure I unmute myself on my phone. So I see some people sharing. Thank you, Janine. I was, and as, as folks are sharing in the comment box, I just wanted to share back, if, if I may, Janine, just share back. Go some ahead, please, a few. From, from, from the comment. One, I have, I have an aunt who accepted me for who I was. See, I got at my level as a teen and allowed for me to have a voice and feel free to myself. Um, that's just a very profound statement uh, because it speaks on many levels culturally. I, I, I can tell that this comes from a Latina, a Latin speaking person um, and, and how we culturally relate to our families and, and have extended families as aunts also raise us and really and guide us and direct us. So that really speaks to me as well. Thank you for sharing that. Um, moving, moving on, we have had a guidance counselor who told me that everyone feels the same way I did. That was very reassuring. My middle school science teacher, she was, black, she was a black American woman who shared her experiences about growing up and supported me outside of school with a difficult home setting. She made me feel like I could achieve anything, especially going to college. Very empowering. When I was young, I had selective mutism, and I always appreciated people who took the time to make me feel comfortable and valued. One more, Janine, before we move forward. Great. Thank I you. Up, I grew up in New York City. English high school teacher told me, you are smart. I believe in you. Don't listen, excuse me, that's just fi they're coming in fast. Don't listen to naysayers. That will stereotype you. You will go far. She was a white teacher from down south, states where she saw discrimination and wanted no part of it. Great. Thank you so much for folks for sharing. And I know there are a bunch more in the comments um, that reflect, you know, places where um, we've, felt affirmed, we felt like we belonged, and I think I see even a few comments where folks have reflected that perhaps that was not their experience when they were growing up. So thank you so much for sharing and, and for being um, willing to um, offer that reflection to um, the group. Uh, moving on to our next slide. I just want to take a moment to think about our current context, right? So this training, particularly thinking about cultural responsiveness, responding across culture, across difference, um, I'd be remiss if not to, you know, name that we are in a particularly challenging time in our world, right? Um, and, and what you see here in terms of our current context, and it might be hard to see, but you, you have this in PDF form as well, and you also have a workbook to follow along with. Um, this is a chart that shows COVID deaths uh, per 100,000 people up to July 7th for Massachusetts, right? Um, and so just to name that we're in a pandemic, um, we are in an unprecedented time where we're all here virtually, right? The relationships and the way that we've been conducting our life and conducting business as usual is not um, the same. And so wanted to highlight that folks um, are, are, are hurting right now in lots of different ways, right? Whether it's COVID, um, which disproportionately affects communities of color, um, affects marginalized communities, affects folks who had already been experiencing disparities. Or you see here we have the cover of the New Yorker, um, which, which was released a, a few weeks, I think, after George Floyd's death, um, and, and highlighting, you know, that we're also in this time where we see um, folks, young people, old people, um, going to the streets to protest racial injustice that we've seen in this country since its founding, right? But it's an interesting kind of 
scary, marvelous uh, time to be alive and to also be supporting young people through this. So to think about how do I connect with young people? How do I help them understand what's going on in the world? How do I uh, make them feel a sense of belonging and understanding um, without acknowledging what's happening, right? That's, that's the first place where we can feel young people. So I just wanted to take a moment and say that um, we understand that the context in which we do this training is different from the last ASOS training that we provided and different from ones prior. And, you know, a month or two from now, things are going to look a little different as well. And so acknowledging for ourselves and for the young people that we work with just what's going on um, in the world, I think is really important. Um, and speaking of ASOS, again, thankful that we have these opportunities to be able to offer trainings like this to folks um, over the year and, and being able to be responsive to the needs of after school and out of school time workers. We appreciate that as well. So we can move along. So I want to hop right in and we're going to define culture, right, and, and think about exactly what are we talking about here. So I wanted us to have a shared understanding of the definitions that we'll be using throughout this training. Um, so culture, as we're defining it, a shared learned symbolic system of values, beliefs, and attitudes that shapes and influence perception and behavior. Um, if folks quickly in the chat, when you say culture, what do you think of, right? There are some things when I hear culture, I might think of um, food, I might think of, you know, other kind of aspects and dimension, right? What's learned from family, I see dress, right? Um, where are the places where we learn culture? We heard family. What about other places? Where does that show up and how do we learn that in our world? Do we just pop up and all of a sudden we know what culture is? <laughs> or, or how is it learned and shared? Right, I see. Heritage, tradition, stress, community, school, right? Institutions, there's youth culture for sure, right? We learn that from family, from media, everyday routines we experience. So, you know, starting off just to acknowledge that everyone experiences culture in one way or another, right? And there are dominant cultures and then there are cultures that are not the dominant culture, right? Culture serves everyone in some particular way and then in some ways, if you aren't in the dominant culture, right, you do not get served by <laughs> what's happening in the world. And so for us, it's really thinking about cultural responsiveness, how we are capable of embracing, working with, and learning about cultural differences and responding appropriately. And so we use the term responsiveness versus competency, humility, other terms like that, because we really think it's about not just noticing that there's difference, not just seeing it, um, but how do I, as a youth worker, I as a person who's responsible for caring for young people and supporting young people respond appropriately to those cultural differences that I might be experiencing. And understanding that we walk through the world with our own worldviews and cultures and beliefs Right. And so we have to kind of challenge those, check those, understand those before we can even begin to be in relationship with young people, which is what we're going to do in a minute um, as a group. Right. But I wanted to share the definition, kind of get it out there. I see comments coming through. So thank you so much for participating and sharing your thoughts. Um, but I, I want to if anyone has any questions about our definition as we're sharing it, I wanted to to take a moment to pause to see if there are any thoughts or questions before we move on to an activity. And I see there's some questions that I'll, I'll name out here. Um, I'm not going to answer them just yet. If folks have a response in the chat box, you know, this is also an opportunity for you to dialogue with each other. I see Peg is asking, how do I affirm your culture without appropriating it? Right, which is an interesting and important question um, for folks. Culture can be shaped by shared trauma, right? celebrations, activities, routines as a part of culture. So thank you for, for uh, your notes. And again, keep talking. We'll take moments. And Miguel, I'll call on him to share some of your thoughts and whatnot throughout the course of the training. Um, but I, I want you to kind of keep communicating with each other um, through the chat box. And, and I may not be able to catch everything, but please do share. All right, so next slide. 
this is just a little graphic I like to share when I think of culture, right? Culture, the, the concept of it being like an iceberg, right? So there are things that we see and we understand, um, and then there's so much under the surface, right? And, and I think it might be a little hard to see, but again, you have this as a PDF, but things like, you know, we need dress and food and kind of things that are very visible. Um, many times, but then there's what we believe, right? Patterns of kinship, the way we think about time even, right? The way we think about our bodies and beauty, um, all of those things um, are part of our culture and the way that we kind of interact and see the world. So it's important to note that as we're working with people in relationship, right, there's the, you know, when we, I think about when we do like culture days or diversity days, it's usually bring a, a food in that, you know, you eat um, in your family or in your culture, which is great. I love food. I'm always talking about breaking bread and eating something. So I think those are a great entryway, but to really, really think about how we best support young people and families, we've got to peel back that layer, go under the iceberg, and really understand that there are lots of different ideas around culture and ideas that shape the way that our young people and our families interact, and us too. All right, next slide, please. And again, we'll make sure that you have all of this um, in PDF and also in PowerPoint form to download as well. So I'm gonna ask folks to do an activity, right? Again, I wanna start off by helping us understand ourselves, our culture, our background, who we are, how we walk through the world, our identities, and kind of what has shaped some of our experiences, and how those experiences shape the way that we relate to young people. So this is in your workbook. I believe it is on page, if you have your workbook, which was sent out before the training, it is on page five in your workbook starts on page four and five um, and there's actually a, a little chart prior to that thinking about historically included and historically excluded groups right so i named that there are there are dominant parts of the culture there are groups and identities which depending on where you are may have always been included in terms of our institutions um, in media and different ways that we walk through the world and interact right so you may be used to seeing yourself affirmed and your experience and, and the way that you kind of operate. Then for some of us, we sit in groups that have been historically excluded. Um, a lot of us, there's overlap, right? And so what I want to do with this activity is have us think about where do we sit, right? What are some of the identities that we hold and those experiences that shape those identities? So I'm going to ask you in your workbook, or if you even just have a piece of scrap paper, um, you can think about the historically excluded groups and the historically included groups which you belong to. And you'll notice um, some of them might be, you know, more obvious to you. I will also note that there are probably definitely groups that are missing from this chart. So if there are places that you want to um, add, um, you know, check boxes or identities that are not represented, please do. But I'm going to ask you to take a minute or so to just kind of take a look and think about where do I sit, right? What groups am I in that might be excluded and groups that are historically included? And, and per the instructions, I want you to think about if you have ever been part of these groups, right? So for instance, on the historically um, excluded groups, children is one of the boxes. We've all been children at some point, right? So I see looking for Vietnam vets. Um, I see that as a checkbox, right? And, and so you might have some questions as to how certain groups ended up on one side or the other side. Um, you can send those to us privately and we're happy to have that discussion with you. If we were in training, we would do this um, take a little bit more time for this, but I'm asking you to explore uh, the, the list and kind of take a look at it based on where you sit. And then we'll move to the next slide and we're gonna do the activity and I'll put you in groups to kind of have some conversation about this. So yes, seeing, not seeing biracial and first generation Americans, neurological mental health groups, there are certainly groups that are missing from this, this chart. 
And I also want to state that this is a particularly right, it's an American context, right? Um, that these excluded included groups come from. So having looked at the list and you know selecting the groups that you have been a part of. We'll go back to the previous slide for one minute. Also, you have this. You should have received an email with a workbook um, earlier this morning. And so on page four and five of the workbook, this chart is also there. So we'll take one more minute before I give you the assignment for your, your groups. And I just put the link to the workbook actually in the chat so if folks want to reference that in case you did not get that. All right, so we'll move to the next slide. So what I want you to do in your chat, in your um, breakout rooms, is think about reflecting on your identity, right? Which excluded groups have you been a member? Which historically included groups are you or have you been a member? And take some time, first five minutes in your groups, I want you to think about first starting with those excluded groups. What were some experiences that have shaped, right? How you do your work now? as a youth worker, as a mentor, right? Thinking about your identity, what from that experience of being a historically excluded group do you bring to the work with you? How does that support you in relationship with young people? How might that in some ways create a barrier? And then I'm gonna ask you to spend a little time moving to the included groups. So you're gonna be put in groups of maybe six to 10 people and really just reflect on checking the boxes, doing the activity, and then what does this mean for a relationship? Talking about both your excluded and your included groups that you've been a member of. And we'll, we'll make sure to send the instructions to the breakout rooms um, so that you have them and you remember them, but you're thinking about those check boxes that you made. You may have added some categories because we acknowledge that there are some categories that are missing. And I want you to think about, again, what groups have I been in, right? Excluded and included, and how does that impact my relationships, my ability to be in relationships specifically with young people, with the work that we're all doing? Because the way we show up, the experiences that we have certainly have an impact on the relationships that we have with young people. And it's that exploration that we're gonna do a little snippet of, right? This is a lifelong exploration, just like cultural responsiveness is a lifelong journey, but we wanted to give you an opportunity to, to have some reflection with your peers before we go through the rest of the training. So Milani's gonna cut us into breakout groups right now. We'll give you about 10 minutes to reflect and talk, and then we'll come back. Um, Olivia, can you stop sharing the screen right now? Thank you. Those of you who are still here, um, you just need to accept the invite to the breakout rooms if you haven't done that yet. Thank <laughs> you. 
we got Joseph. Let me just make sure he, you are in one of the rooms. Kayla, Charlie, uh, Pagan Jimenez, Caitlin. Give them a minute, Milani. They may have moved on to the restroom. Or I see Joseph. Let me just send assign him to a room. I'm sorry. One second. It's just a couple of people that I they just came. What did you say, Miguel? I'm sorry. You may have went to the restroom or something. So, so I'll send you. Give me one second. Just make sure I don't send you to something that. Move to. <coughs> Okay. Yeah. And Milani, can you broadcast the instructions to the breakout rooms, please? Yep. And those instructions should be in the PowerPoint, right? So the instructions, um, the instructions are just to discuss the excluded groups and included groups you belong to, and how those experiences in those groups. Discuss, support you. Please discuss the, what? Repeat that. So here, actually, I'm gonna type it in the chat. Just put you. it in the chat and I will just roll yep. it. Yep. Thank you. Miguel, I send you to room number two, whenever you're ready. And Charlie is having some audio challenges. Kyla, do you need help getting into your room? Kyla and Christina Pagan Jimenez. And Caitlin. I put the question in the chat box, Melania. Okay. Janine, that, that only stays in our chat box. I know she's supposed to copy it and put oh, it in the um, broadcasting. <laughs> Great job so far, Jimmy. Awesome job. Thanks, Trina. And thank you, Olivia, for um, quickly pivoting. I realized I hadn't tested the sound um, on mine, and, and given that you knew how to do that, I was like, I'm not even going to try it right now. <laughs> so I have one video coming up and then another video after that. Just make sure, Olivia, okay. you've seen actually the, the presentation from Google, the Google document. Yeah, I, I was using that, but for some reason, it, I think that because I was already in um, – slideshow presenting mode when I shared for some reason it just looked weird so I'm gonna see what happens if I try to I try it now so I can we can see quickly it won't present to everybody will it no okay All right, let me try it yeah once they're in the breakout rooms they basically can't see in the main room okay. until they leave the breakout room Let's see. Okay, that yeah. looks better, right? That's much better. Yeah. Okay, so I think that that, I don't know why that was an issue, but I guess that I have to start it from here and then go into present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh oh. Thank you. Yeah. Malani, how long have they been in breakout rooms? Um, they have uh, three minutes left. Okay, can you give them a three minute warning? Three minute warning, sure. Yeah. Because it'll, it'll, at a minute, it'll give them, it'll prompt for a warning automatically. Mm -hmm. 
Everybody's going outside. Okay, let's put this on. So I actually didn't do the automatic, Jenny. I, I okay. did break out everybody for certain reasons, so which we could talk about later, but I think it, it actually, that way make sure, I made sure I had a even number of the MMP staff and all that. Okay. And then Milani, um, I'm going to type a message in the chat for you to type in the breakout room again. Thank you. We have so far like 80 something participants. Mm -hmm. That's a great number. When it's high, it's 83, Melody. Huh? 83, yeah. yeah. That's a really good number. So I put that in there. Then when they come back from the breakout sessions, do you want to kick that off or how would you support them? So I'll kick it off with just prompting them and then I'll say that um, if they want to type it in the chat or if they want to raise their hand or, or kind of signal that they would like to share, we'll take like two or three observations and then you can, um, you can call on those folks or read what's in the chat. And you could, you, you could explain again how to raise your hand and which actually, how did you do that? <laughs> it's in the... Um, you have to Is go to it, participants. Oh, yeah. the actions in the bottom. So on the bottom, you click on participants and then you have all your features. Yes, no, go, go slow. And if you hit more as well, you can also let us know that you're taking a break. Because reaction only has the clapping and the. That's reaction. So you have to click on the participant tab. Click on your participants. Participants. Now, if you come down, you should see yes, no, goes faster, more. You see Olivia has her thumb up. Yeah, I just put my thumb up. And you see how I, I, I put myself, I'm going on break. I have a little coffee thing on. Uh, yeah. But if they can't find it, they can just do thumbs up too. That's fine. Yeah, in the thumbs up would be the Also, yep, utilize reactions. All right, so I think folks are coming back from the breakout. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. And so as folks are returning, we're just waiting for folks to come on back. Um, if you know, uh, we'd love to hear any thoughts, observations, questions um, that you know you from your conversation and your breakouts, um, please feel free to share that either in the chat or um, if you can see down on the bottom of your screen, we highlighted that reactions section. If you want to put your thumb up, that will let me all know that you are interested in um, being unmuted and verbally sharing your question or observation. So We'll take two or three folks if you'd like to share. Um, it looks like about half the group is back. So we'll just give you another minute or two to go ahead. All right.
right, so um, again, if folks want to, from your conversations, which I acknowledge are brief, um, but any interesting ahas or observations or maybe questions that you have coming out of it, and again, we're, we're talking about how who you are, your identity, your membership in certain groups um, or in experiences that come from that um, have shaped how you do your work, how you work with young people. So I, I see how fast it was. We could, I could pose that question and that could be the rest of our training today, <laughs> but I want to get through a little bit more content. If you want to either use the reactions uh, in your, in your uh, Zoom kind of. Um, it, your, um, uh, if, I, if I can jump in. Uh, yeah. I actually noticed sort of a thread uh, between us, which is really interesting. Um, Please do, sure. Yeah, so all of us who were in, in our breakout group, we kind of, we said multiple things where we were in, in buckets that were excluded, um, but then how we moved into other buckets was interesting. Um, so all of us kind of had, you know, at least one or two or three places that we would moved into other inclusive buckets. Uh, but also, um, Terrence brought this up and then I thought about it. I was like, that's another thing that brought us all kind of like that common thread was in terms of how people perceive us and the things that, you know, perceptions that they have just by looking at us kind of like in, in terms of the iceberg um, mm -hmm. and how he, you know, he has to, he feels like he has to pick up certain things or there may be observations about him. And it's the same thing from, you know, if you're a person who's getting older, um, who's going into a di different dem demographic or so on and so forth. Like there's just so many things um, just on face value that people will react to you uh, and or treat you in a certain way or you know, make assumptions about you. So I thought that was really interesting in our very brief, but very, um, I thought, profound conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I think, you know, everything that you've said there is, is you know, spot on. Um, depending on, you know, your context and situation, some of those things might change in the group, um, depending on, and, and can folks hear me? Okay, great. I'm frozen on my screen, but I want to make sure that you can hear I me. I can hear you. Great. Hi, Terrence. Um, so, you know, depending on, on the identities that you hold, right, we can transition in and out of some of those identities, like childhood, disability status, um, and what people see on face value, Rosie, I see that in the comments, may not be always representative of what's underneath, right? And based on our experiences, we have some worldviews, right, based on, on the ways that we've walked through the world, and your young people have that too, and the same thing is happening, right? We're making assumptions and quick decisions about what we see um, taking in very limited information and I see someone put implicit inherit bias you are foreshadowing exactly where we're going we're about to watch a little video on implicit bias and kind of explore what that means for our work do I have one other comment um, if anyone else I, wants to share yeah so uh, so I wanted to say that uh, I thought about my faith growing up Mm -hmm. And uh, within that community, I felt uh, included. However, when I stepped away from my circle, my growing up circle, then I dealt with people of other faith and people who did not embrace my faith. So then I felt excluded. Uh, but I was just thinking, um, even as I was saying that, that, and somebody mentioned jumping from one group to the other, how our, uh, our, our children and, and teenagers and young folks need to be given tools to be able to jump into different groups um, without feeling rejected and personalizing it, which is something that our agency is working on. It, it's gonna take courage, it's gonna take awareness, it's gonna take resiliency to be able to kind of break <laughs> some of the uh, dynamics or groups that exclude you is like, so what, you don't really accept me, but here I am, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that if we have an opportunity to go for, we should not pull away. Obviously, mm -hmm. don't put yourself in danger, but you should not be pushed away or pulled pull away because of not being included by a certain group. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing, right? And I, I think, you know, you bring up, um, you highlight something that one of our colleagues out in California 
um, you're touching on something similar that Tori Weston Serdan always talks about this idea of how do we prepare young people for this world that we, we have them entering and she she always says that um, part of our roles as youth workers and, and practitioners is to purify the air and clear the water right and so she says that this world right again context is toxic for not only young people for us right there's so many ways in which young people um, feel as if they don't belong or or certain spaces are not affirming and, and accepting of them um, for lots of different reasons and so instead of pretending that that doesn't exist right part of the work she does is to have those honest and open conversations with young people to say listen this is the world right like there's a lot happening right for those of you who are still connected to some of your young people maybe you're running summer programming the other young people in your lives to to deny um the the current existence and, and, and current challenges that they have um sets them up for failure right because we really want to think about how do we as you said help young people develop skills coping mechanisms to be able to walk through the world and be able to occupy space and feel like they belong and talk about that right so when we send young people off to college and it's like okay we've done everything academically to prepare you but have we prepared you for that social environment that we're sending you to um, so some of that again how do we use ourselves in doing that work with young people right acknowledging mm -hmm our reality, our existence, and support young people to have those honest conversations and affirm the fact that, yeah, things are scary right now between COVID, between what you see on TV, on YouTube, um, in your communities, in your neighborhoods. Um, we want to at least acknowledge what is happening and, and be able to have real conversations which are based on relationship to support young people. I see one other hand. Um, I think Tina, um, was it Miguel, has their hand raised. We can take that comment and then move forward. Tina, you're muted. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, girl. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to say, when we were talking in our um, breakaway rooms, one of the things that kept coming up is how young kids can notice cultural differences. And in the research I've done, they can start to notice things like that as early as, you know, three years of age. And then I'll just end it by saying this, because I know we're about to see the video, but uh, the experience, one of the two that I related was one that I had at an audition. When I walked into the room, didn't even say hello, the facilitator looked at me and said, I have no roles for you. Bye-bye. And I went, okay. And the other one was, if you Google this on Google, it's called the paper bag test. That happened to me when I was in kindergarten. So I just wanted to make sure that you saw that. And uh, I'm looking forward to the video. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing those experiences. I also want to add very quickly, um, I think it's important to, um, I, I mean, I, yes, I agree with the last comment and also important to remember that we are also engaging families. So just remember all these conversations because the families are the part that we need to reach out to. And, and a lot of times, a, you know, a, you know, keep the same thinking, <laughs> especially working with families. Great. Thank you, Milani. So I'm going to ask Olivia to share the screen again, and she'll launch us into a quick video about implicit bias. Um, and so again, would like you to kind of look at the video and think about what does this mean for my work for relationships? Um, some folks are familiar with implicit bias, it's learned beliefs, attitudes, stereotypes. Um, can you go back one second, <laughs> please? <laughs> Oops. There we go. About a particular group result in harmful or preferential treatment of members of that group. So I won't say much more because the video I think does a really good job is from uh, the New York Times from some work that they had done a, a while ago on implicit bias. So we're not going to launch you into breakout rooms after that, but I, I will hold some time for us to just get initial reactions um, to the video as we think about our work in building relationship with young people. There you go. We can move forward now, Olivia. Thank you. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. 2016 was the year that implicit bias went somewhat mainstream. 
Yeah, so when Hillary Clinton mentioned implicit bias in the debates, our phones started blowing up, all our friends started emailing us about it. But what is implicit bias? Implicit biases are basically thought processes that happen without you even knowing it. Little mental shortcuts that hold judgments you might not agree with. And sometimes the shortcuts are based on race. First, some clarity. Saying someone has an implicit bias is different from calling someone a racist. The word racist is a highly loaded term, right, here in American society. A lot of times when people are using it, they're thinking of the kind of old fashioned Ku Klux Klan style racist. But implicit bias isn't anywhere near that, you know, explicit. Implicit bias is something that comes out of ordinary mental functioning, out of how the mind normally works. We've all grown up in a culture with media images, news images, conversations we heard at home, our education. Think of that as a fog we've been breathing our whole life. We'd never even realized it, what we were taking in. And that fog causes associations that lead to biases. I somehow know that if you say peanut butter, I'm gonna say jelly. That's an association that's been ingrained in me because throughout my life, peanut butter and jelly are together. And in many forms of media, there is an over-representation of black men and violent crime being paired together. And because of that, I actually deep down inside have been taught that black men are violent and aggressive and not to be trusted, that they're criminals, that they're thugs. With all those associations, I'm not trying to let us off the hook, but in some ways, none of us stood a chance. Starting today, we'll post a video a day dealing with one challenge of understanding implicit bias and its relationship to race and exploring ways we might combat the problem. One more thing, if you're seeing this and thinking that it doesn't apply to you, well, you might be falling prey to the blind spot bias. That's the scientific name for a mental bias that allows you to see biases in others, but not in yourself. We're biased. <gasps> Great. Thank you so much, Olivia. <laughs> so, thanks. So I'll pause for, for a moment, a few moments. Um, if folks have initial reactions, again, I know the, the concept is familiar to a lot of folks there, but as we think about moving from thinking about ourselves, still thinking about for me, if I think of implicit bias as a barrier, right, to cultural responsiveness, as a barrier to really being able to work across difference and understand folks um, and support them and affirm them and to purify the air and clear the water, right, as, as Tori says. So what are some thoughts that people have as you think about, you know, supporting young people in your after school and out of school time programs? Um, understanding implicit bias and how that impacts your work. Initial reactions so, or thoughts about it. So one of the thoughts, um, if I may, um, one of the thoughts and um, one of the things that came to mind after watching that video is interesting because I think I have seen that video before or maybe a clip of it. Um, but I think especially when it came to like differentiating um, implicit bias versus racism. I know that I guess you could say racism does have that, like the word in itself and the connotations surrounding that word and like what that means. Like a lot of people, I think like if they're being accused of of being racist cause that causes there to be like this deflection, this defense. Oh, I think you're breaking up a little, maybe. How valuable the use of language is when talking about bias. Everyone has prejudice, and therefore, like, anyone and everyone can be racist and probably has, and, and it may have been unconscious, right? So there, there was just kind of, like, that level of having... I think you you broke up again. Um, and make sure that they're clear. And oh, I'm sorry. 
No, it's totally fine. It's just you're 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 pausing a little bit. So I, I think folks heard, you know, and, and Rosie picked up on on also what she had mentioned around the idea of preferentialism. Young people observe the preferentialism that is supported adults and that distinction between implicit bias and racism and understanding that implicit bias is something we all experience. I, I think just to, I'm trying to summarize what I think you were saying because we missed a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just kind of like making sure to have those clear definitions of of each word and like what that could trigger in other people and like how that, I guess, reaction could take place. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I see yeah, someone was mentioning the um, Harvard implicit bias test. We can send that link out and I think maybe you sent it there. Um, it's, it's the IAT and it's an interesting test. They give you kind of categories and you go through and you kind of click through online based on pictures that come up to test your implicit bias in certain areas. Um, I did it around um, race and gender and it noticed that I, or it noted that I had um, bias towards black men, right? So here I am, black woman, uh, lived with, <laughs> Um, love been around black men my entire life and yet still um, the, the test noted some bias on my side right um, and thank you Jen I see you popping up there with the, with the test um, are there any other folks who who would like to share um, I know Rosie I saw your comment I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and say anything else um, or anyone else before we move along, and again, I'm sorry for the fast clip of this. We're trying to get in a lot um, and, and be able to offer you some opportunity to, to still engage at the same time. All right, and I see a question from Terrence. When someone knows they think differently about other certain groups of people, if what they're thinking is in their heads, and I think that's the really insidious thing about implicit bias, right? It's, it's, it's like underneath, you talk about those layers, um, so deeply embedded within us that we are subconsciously making these choices, decisions, having understandings that we don't necessarily realize that we have until we sit down to examine, right? Um, ourselves and examine, I always ask myself why, right? What do we notice about the way that we work with young people? What assumptions do we think we might be having? Constantly challenging, why do I want to build a program like this? Why do I want to serve this group of young people? Why do I believe that they need this versus that, right? So a lot of it is um, really spending some time, again, exploring who you are, what you believe, what you were brought up to believe, um, and how you can disrupt some of that thinking to constantly challenge that. Um, we have definitions for folks in the workbook on page seven, which explores implicit bias and lots of other definitions. Um, I think someone was talking about stereotypes and equity and, and um, prejudice. And so we have a lot of those definitions there so people can review those and have some shared understanding as well. So I wanna move forward a little bit. We have one more video. I wanna quickly look at this continuum of cultural responsiveness. Um, and so again, having explored kind of our own beliefs, um, the idea of implicit bias and some understanding of that about how we operate and the need to kind of have strategies to change our behaviors, our not attitudes, um, and what we understand so that we can develop new skills to be culturally responsive. I'll quickly go through this. Um, I like charts. I like things where you can plot yourself and kind of move forward and move backwards. This um, concept of being more culturally responsive, we understand it as a journey, right? It's something that you're constantly working on. But sometimes it's helpful to be able to look and say, huh, in this area, I might be here. And in this area, I might be there. And so there are six points here when thinking about cultural responsiveness that I find it helpful to kind of plot from cultural destructiveness all the way to cultural proficiency or competency or, or responsiveness, right? Um, and, and underneath each kind of point, are some statements you might hear someone say or some things that you might have thought in your own regard, right? So cultural destructiveness, which I hope no one is there at all, but, you know, we all in certain ways, um, you know, have challenges, is you see the difference and you stomp it out, right? So their, their culture doesn't value education. It's the elimination of other people's culture and belief that the dominant culture is neutral, right? 
um, cultural incapacity, you see the difference, you make it wrong. Why won't these immigrants learn English? Cultural blindness, you see the difference, but you act like you don't. So how many times have we heard people say, oh, I'm colorblind, I don't see race, I don't see this. If you don't see that I'm a black woman, if I'm standing in front of you and you can't see my brown skin and acknowledge the experiences that I may have specifically because of my gender and my race and my um, class background and all the other kind of ways that I show up in the world, you're not really seeing me and you also can't then how can you affirm me if you don't see me so really I think a lot of times that's where I hear a lot of us kind of sit and, and understanding how challenging and problematic that is right cultural precompetence you see the difference but you respond inadequately so there's an awareness or limitation maybe that there's some skills that you need to build um, but you know it might be something where african-american boys represent the majority of office referrals so I notice something's going on um, but I don't really know what to do about it right I know that that what we would call the prison or the school to prison pipeline is a thing right so how do you explore that how do you understand that okay it's not the boys it's not the black boys there's something about this system and this institution that we need to explore and look at and what's embedded in there right what are the beliefs what are the assumptions that we're making that are making it such that a particular population has a specific challenge in this institution which is leading to negative outcomes right cultural uh, competence see the difference understand the difference that difference makes right um, so maybe recruiting students from underrepresented populations for extracurricular activities and then proficiency or what we would call responsiveness you see the difference and you respond effectively in a variety of environments right so I understand that something is different here. I understand that, you know, thinking about that example of African American boys uh, representing the majority of office referrals. And I, I know I'm willing to explore that the problem is not with the boys. So then who is it? Is it the teachers? Is it the administration? Is it the system? Right? There's a difference. There's something happening here and I need to be able to now effectively respond. Is it training for my teachers in, you know, anti-racist, um, you know, anti-bias work? What do I need to do to respond appropriately to meet the needs of those young people and centering the young people in that experience? So this continuum is something that, again, you know, you can take back to your organizations and kind of think about where might I be in different areas. One program might be in one space and another program might be in another space. Individuals who you work with, you might all be across the continuum. But I find that it's helpful to really explore and look at your practices and kind of think about where do I sit there. Are there any questions that folks want to chat in the chat box about this? I see some comments here. Um, there are some, I, hope. I don't see any questions as of yet. So if you want me to res respond to some comments, we can. Do we have the continuum in our PowerPoint? So yes, Peg, the PowerPoint is what you're seeing now. And then the continuum is also in your workbook on page eight with even more um, kind of explanation and um, guidance around that. Can I comment on Mehdi's colorblindness comment? It's a good point. So unfortunately, the amount of organizations these days saying we don't see higher notice color cultural blindness is appalling. Um, I, I would agree <laughs> if that's the point that, that we're looking at. Um, I, I think, you know, again, some people, uh, particularly I would in my experience, it has been folks who are in the dominant culture, depending on what that culture is. Um, and, and mostly, again, in my experience, it has been white folks saying that about people of color, of not seeing color. Um, I, I think it, it, it seems like a, a good way to be able to say like, nope, every, I just look at people's skills and, and who they are and what they bring to the table and you know, your color and all of that has nothing to do with it. But I would argue, and I think most folks, right, really thinking about who I am, the way I walk through the world. Again, my experience as a black woman in nonprofit institutions, it matters, right? And it matters the way that the institution responds to me and my blackness and my gender. Um, and really examining that because if, we, if we're all colorblind, it lets us off, off the hook for actually doing the work of exploring um, and interrogating our practices, our policies, our procedures, and our, our kind of ways of behavior for not only our colleagues, for the families that we work with, for the young people that we're serving. All right, so I'm gonna move forward. Can you click, Olivia? 
All right, so, and again, we're moving at a pretty fast clip, but we're going to watch this video. And what I'm going to ask you to do is um, look at the video. And I, I wanted to try to give some real life or scenarios or something. I want us to take a look and see what challenges do we see in the video, right? There are two scenarios. These are both healthcare focused scenarios, but they're with young people. So all of our, the context may not be exactly the same, but in a lot of cases, young people come to us to get their needs met, right? Young people and families in our communities. And so I want you to watch the interactions in the video, right? Because I want to like make this as real as possible in this moment as we can virtually together. And then I want us to kind of comment and know what are the areas where we might see some bias or we see um, that differential treatment and what are the places in the scenarios where the, the adult kind of went wrong or areas that they can improve and in the other scenario what are the things that are working really well. So we'll watch this and then um, you know to have a little bit less of my voice we'll have folks raise their hand and note what they saw in the scenario okay. Olivia, you can take it away. Mariana Flores. Um, Mariana Royas. You're late. Dr. Simon, you have a patient. Thanks. Okay, so anything else other than the pain you had mentioned? Well, nothing this week, just the pain. It's pretty bad and it's been on and off for a couple of weeks. I think it's getting worse. Mm, I'm sure, yeah. Uh, I'm going to prescribe you a topical pain medicine and get you some condoms. I'll take care of you for today. Um, why do I need condoms and what's this medicine about it? Do I need to know anything else? It's just a topical cream. The pharmacist will let you know all about it. Everybody needs condoms. Yeah, but what's this pain I'm feeling? I mean... I see this all the time in girls just like you. Trust me, it'll go away. Um, we're good here though, right? Yeah? And you're good and you're current on all your insurance? Seriously? I mean, I was hoping I could get an STD test. Sure. Can we order an STD test? Nurses will take care of you. Okay. Okay. Great. Hi, I'm Dr. Bill. I'm Sharif. Nice to meet you. Um, what brings you into the clinic today? My parents said I should come in and also my school nurse said it would be free if I came in, so I just... Are you concerned about anything in particular? Not really. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you came in again uh, because there are certain things that a guy should come in to talk about with their doctors and also sort of get a physical exam so they know and make sure that nothing else is wrong. What I did notice in reviewing the questionnaire that you left the question about sex blank. Yeah, my parents and my mom have very strict rules about dating. Okay. I understand about your family and religion. but. When patients have conversations with their doctors, the conversation is, is private and confidential, especially regarding sex. There are only a couple of times where we need to get someone's help, and that's if you hurt yourself or want to hurt yourself or hurt other people. Yeah. Okay. Are you sexually active? Well, I have to be careful because it would hurt my parents if I got a girl pregnant. Okay. Do you use protection? What do you mean? Some guys tell me they use condoms or their girlfriends take pills. All right. So again, I know um, many of us may not be in that clinical sort of medical setting, but I think there were themes uh, that we may have seen um, in, in the interaction of the two um, adults, two, three adults with the young people. So what did we what did we see there in terms of ways that either implicit bias or, um, you know, perhaps if we're looking at our chart being culturally destructive, um, or, or other kind of ways that, that are not supportive of young people and relationships would show up or did show up? Well, I, well, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I saw so many things wrong in there mm -hmm. right? because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm come from a background of working with youth in, in a medical field. So, mm -hmm. um, I think the first video showed us that, uh, the doctor was just, um, doing his, uh, I guess, and understanding that um, he probably thought that the client was already sexually active without even asking or 
or or going further on what was going on. He wasn't able to give explanation on why was he just prescribing medicine. And that's something that happens a lot with with the community I, that I work, especially the culture that I work with. They tend to see the doctor as the person who knows the most and they end up living without understanding what they really need to do and if that brings to different other problems in their health in their life um i guess that the the girl was advocating for herself and he didn't even really um took the time to hear what she was really asking she, and he also had someone else in the room which in a lot of cultures um you know, I, I couldn't bring my mom. And my mom always wanted to be in the room. Like she was like, no, you have to be there. I have to be there. I need to know everything. And, and sometimes you do need the youth to trust someone to talk about different other things because they really can tell their parents because of the way they have grew up or the way they have been raised. And so I think it's, Really, we need to know the sensitive of your culture background. Uh, in the second video, I love that the doctor give the respect that the, child, the, the, the young adult needed. I believe that all everyone needs respect from a three-year-old to a, you know, a 90 years old lady. I think we all deserve respect. And he, the doctor was giving the respect and, um, and asked the questions. And I think he was identifying with him a, a little more than what the first doctor did or the first person did. Okay, thank you so much. The, that was that was pretty thorough. Um, and thank you for sharing your experience of working with young people. And I see a lot of folks have responded um, around you know things like the receptionist correcting, um, name pronunciation, um, really wanted to finish quickly, not not really listening and, um, you know, respecting the young woman, maybe making some assumption about girls like you, right? Um, it was not lost on me that that doctor, I'm making the assumption that the doctor um, was a, a white person um, and, and shared a different cultural background than the young lady. Um, did that play into the way that he interacted? Perhaps. Um, perhaps that's just the way that man is, right? Um, in the second example, we had, you know, talking about my teacher as well, um, a, a doctor who maybe shared some some pieces of cultural identity, right? Um, and so not saying that that is what has to happen because we know that working across difference, you can do that effectively and, and be able to build relationships, but you have to be able to explore and, and really think about how am I showing up for these young people so that they can bring their full selves? How am I not dismissive of young people, their parents, their caregivers? Um, and so there's a lot to unpack in these videos. I did share the link with you all this comes from um i believe the uh what is it? it's the university of michigan they have some great um toolkits um, with videos and, and facilitators guides that you can use in your training or, or reflecting with your staff so i shared the link in the chat box that has the links to the video and as well as some guiding questions and ways you can debrief this so thank you so much for sharing, folks. We have um, 13 minutes left, so I want to move ahead quickly. And I'll, I'll share this slide, and this is also in your workbook. This is something that I find interesting to identify particular behavior. So again, once you plot yourself, um, that's kind of like a theoretical, okay, am I doing this? Am I being colorblind? What are the ways in which I'm trying to practice? But what are the actual behaviors that are showing up? Um, and so this takes a look at what we might call modern isms, right? Um, modern ways, and, and when I say modern, I mean that in the same way in the video it referenced, sometimes we think of specifically racism. Um, you know, we think of the KKK, we think of very specific experiences that um, folks of color have had to endure. Um, for a long time and are still enduring, yet we also know that there are other ways which racism shows up in our world and the same thing for other isms, right? So thinking about um, some of the behaviors that we see and we do, what are the ways that we can change those behaviors and operate differently? So thinking about dysfunctional rescuing, right? Um, how do we sometimes show up and decide that we need to save young people, right? Versus functional helping. Um, so I won't go through all of them, but I think, you know, when you have some time, taking a look at really 
really exploring your practice and saying, are there ways that I'm doing some of these things, even if I don't realize I'm doing it? And how can I shift my behavior to be one of the alternative behaviors? So we'll move forward. And then before we move into our framework, thinking about change strategies. So you know, we, we want to walk away with thinking about what can we do? And I think we're always so quick to jump to action. It's like, okay, yes, yes, right? Like, we know that racism, we know that sexism, we know that bias against queer folks is a thing. We know that, you know, folks with disabilities, we know that this shows up everywhere. And I want to learn about it, but I want to do something about it, right? Most of the time in our trainings, we find that folks are eager to move to action. I would implore you to please reflect more. <laughs> and then think about when is time for change as I'm doing that? How, where, what are the kind of areas in my work and in my life that I want to explore how I'm going to make that change? I personally think you start with the personal. So you have to change your thoughts and feelings, right? Increase your awareness. This training is doing some of that, right? Have a, a different lens for looking at the way that you're doing the work um, and your openness to learning. The interpersonal, right? So those relationships with your young people, with families, with staff. So your skills, your communication patterns. Then institutional, right? Which we understand institutional and cultural, depending on your positionality and who you are and where you sit in the organization, those might be harder. So the structural barriers and the policies and procedures and programming and being able to look at that and really explore and, and start making some change there, that takes power sometimes in an organization. And so we still think it starts with you to be able to identify, okay, what are the areas that I need? And then if I'm operating in this program, what about the program might need to, need to change? And then the culture, right? How do I change the culture of an organization, the culture of a school? So how do I create an environment that's representative and welcoming to the org's diversity and understand is, understands differences, celebrates them, and utilizes them, right, in a way that honors people for who they are um, and, and really appreciates people for those differences that they bring to the table. So those are kind of four areas that if you're like, okay, I notice this in my organization. I notice that some of the interactions in my organization happen like that first scenario, and I think that's problematic. So what am I doing, right? How do I make sure that in my engagements, I am hearing people, affirming them, um, saying their name correctly, all these actions that we might take, and then what can you do on the organizational and the cultural level to make that change? So just wanna highlight that these are the places that we can kind of open the door and start thinking about where do I fit and where do I sit, um, and, and thinking through what does it take to actually do that. So let's move forward. I want to go through, and I, I made this relatively quick because for those of you who've been on a lot of our trainings, you have seen this before. This is the developmental relationship framework um, that we use when we think about how to build um, empowering relationships with young people. So it's from the Search Institute who are out in Minnesota, um, and it looks at, you know, what is a relationship that really changes the way that a young person is able to build that um, growth mindset that helps them look at who they are and their identity, right? If we think about um, culturally responsive mentoring and relationships, how are you helping that young person wade through the toxic water, right? And, and wade through the air that maybe is not made for them, right? And some of that, we understand that there are ways that adults can do that. So we wanna give you and leave you with these five actions that it takes to be in that empowering, enduring relationship with young people. They did some research, um, the Search Institute, and you can go to the next slide, and looked at 26,000 young people across the country actually no, in one city, and ask them, where do you get these things from? So this research is informed by young people. Um, and looking at the five areas, the slide is really hard to see, but you have it in your workbook. Um, they looked at parenting adults, siblings, friends, teachers, and program leaders. I would put you all mostly in the program leader area. You might be teachers and friends in, in other capacities or, or parenting adults, but they looked at the five actions, which are express care, challenge growth, provide support, share power, expand possibilities. And what I always like to leave you with, right, is looking at where young people said that they experienced this often or very often. 
And you'll notice if I asked you, do you do these things, right? And you're going to reflect, think, do I do them? Everyone's going to be like, I do them. I do them well. I, I love young people. I challenge them. But when we asked the young people actually what's happening and what's going on and looked at program leaders, for instance, for expand possibilities, which is something that I think we all believe that we do, when we expose young people to different options, 40% said often or very often. For expressing care, which is something that I think all of us would definitely argue that we do, 54% of young people said that. And so I highlight this before we go into the framework quickly to note that we might think that we're doing something, but the way the young people are experiencing it, experience that relationship might look very differently than we believe, you know, what we're doing. And some of that might be because of cultural differences. It might be there's some considerations around culture, around trauma, around experiences that we're not understanding. So the way that I show care, the way that I show up might look different for a young person. And if we don't understand that, and if we don't get that, right, everything that we're doing that we believe, oh, I'm doing so well, I'm, I'm challenging growth. I share power with young people all the time. Share power is the yellow one. And 52% of young people said yes. Um, often or very often. So I share this this graph to kind of give us a little my little fire <laughs> under us to realize that yes, I believe all of you care about young people and are doing good work, doing great work, right? And really build relationships with young people. But I want us to be able to explore and really take a look at how are the young people receiving that? How are we centering their experience to understand that everything we're transmitting, this is what they're actually receiving. And if they're not, if only half of the young people out of 26,000 said yes, often or very often, that's on us somewhere as youth workers, right? So what, where are we missing? What, where's the gap, right? In either our skills, the gap in the way that we're actually expressing that towards young people um, so that we can show up differently and show up better for young people. So I'm gonna walk through, Olivia, each one. So express care, and that's simply, do you like young people, <laughs> right? Do you spend time with them? Do you listen to them? Do you praise them? Next one. And you have this in your workbook as well. Adults navigate, guide young people through hard situations, providing support, advocate on behalf of young people, empower them, set boundaries. So challenge growth, we expect the best. We set that bar high and we help them reach it, hold them accountable and help them reflect on failures, right? So that growth mindset, your, your intelligence, what you're able to do is not fixed, right? You can always reflect and learn and grow and, and continue on. Next. And share power. Now, I'll pause here. This one is really hard for us as adults, right? So really being able to respect young people, take them seriously, treat them fairly, right? If we think about the doctor in our scenario, I do not believe he took that young woman's concern seriously at all, including young people, right, in decisions that affect them. So in programming, um, you know, how do young people have a say in what happens in their programs? Um, collaborating, working with them to solve problems, and sometimes just getting out of the way and letting young people lead. And you can do this in big and small ways. A lot of times, you know, I share this and it's like, well, what do you want me to like have a youth board? And I'm like, well, yeah, I, I do if you can. But depending on, and this is where that examination of your organization, who you are, where you sit, what is the culture of the organization. Bringing a young person into the organization or all of a sudden deciding you're gonna expand youth voice, which is great, but if you do not prepare the other adults in the organization to do that and you don't set the stage, that young person, you might be the only one who understands and affirms and values, but if the rest of the organization and the rest of the folks are not on board, then how do you think that young person's gonna feel? So I say for share power, and really when you're thinking about how you expand youth voice and, and kind of um, uh, share leadership with young people, it's not something that necessarily will happen overnight and it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. It might just be, okay, we have three books that we have to read. We have to read them all. <laughs> so can they pick which book they wanna read first? Right, like small things, right, can add up and we can start small and kind of build up and, and think about how we do this. Move to the next slide. And so expand possibilities. Um, this is really inspiring young people to see um, new things, uh, broadening their horizons and connecting them to others who can help them develop and thrive. All right, so I know I went through that relatively quickly. 
um, but I, I wanted to be able to get through and have us reflect a little bit on those five actions. Um, Olivia, if you could take us back to the slide with the five pieces all together. Great, thank you. So we have a few minutes left, two, three minutes. Um, I, I wonder, and I'm not gonna put you in breakout groups to do this because I don't know that it makes sense, but as you think about those five things, you think about um, cultural responsiveness and supporting young people. In your workbook, at the end, you have not only this chart, but you have some considerations for each of the aspects of the developmental relationship framework. This starts on page 10. So for instance, be dependable. Some of the considerations, and these are considerations thinking about cultural responsiveness and also trauma-informed practice. So trusting adults may be hard for some youth who've had, been abandoned by adults in their past. Prove them wrong, be All trustworthy. Right. So it has you kind of think through they, what are some things I have to understand come out. to be able to do this work having my lens for culture responsiveness and also having a little bit of a trauma-informed lens as well so do folks have just any initial reactions or questions I know we're about to head out but I wanted to share that framework I, I believe you all do it in lots of different ways it's not important that you do all five of them in fact it's impossible to do all five at once really well but what is important is that young people recognize and see that adults in their lives do these things for them work with them on behalf of them and that they're able to identify adults who have these five kind of characteristics and qualities in all areas of their life so that's in your programming and their parents as you saw even in their friends right peer relationships are really important so I want to leave just a, a minute or two for any reflections before we head out and then um, I'll just make one tiny announcement and we'll, we'll end up so do folks have any initial um, or any anything you want to share in the chat before we head out I just want to um, this is Jason from Lynn I want to tell you thank, thank you. you and that that chart with all the the brackets on the bottom is a good reality check um, intention versus impact is always important to look at. So um, it's really helpful, especially now with COVID and the other pandemics we're dealing with. Um, we might intend well, but how it lands is different. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Susan. All right, so if there are any other folks, I see folks are, are wrapping up. Thank you for the work that you do um, to continue to support young people. What I'm going to do, I see people are leaving, but I'm going to quickly share um, the link for the evaluation in the chat here, and I'm going to send it out um, probably later today. You received it earlier um, in that email from Olivia. It would be a huge help to us um, for you to complete the evaluation and let us know how we did. This is the first time we've transitioned this particular training online. Um, so any feedback you have, any thoughts about um, additional trainings that you would like, um, please let us know. I uh, want to do one final shout out and thank you to ASOST and DESI for funding this work. Um, you know, they make it possible for us to be able to be with you and be in community and, and share with you. So I, I appreciate everything that you're doing and I hope to uh, continue to be in community with you and, and maybe have an opportunity to work with you all again soon. So the link, um, in fact, I'm not going to put it in the chat. We'll make sure that you get a follow-up email, but that email that Olivia Taylor Taylor, o. Taylor at massmentors.org sent you all, I think around 10 a.m. or so, has the link to the evaluation. It would be a huge help if you could do that for us. Thank you, thank you so much, and have a great day. Also, if, if, before you leave, if you want to write comments about future trainings that you would like to see, we welcome them. Thank you so much for participating. We're excited to have you with us. Thank you, everyone from MMP who support this call. Thank you. <clears throat> I see.
see someone ask whether tra PDPs or training certificates. We don't do PDPs, um, but we can, um, we can, we have a, a certificate of um, like, you know, participation um, that we can work out for folks. So if that's something of interest to you, please email um, either me, jsmith at massmentors.org or Milani, M. Mendoza, M-E-N-D-O-Z-A, at massmentors.org and we can provide that for you um, to show that you attended this training. All right. There you go, Milani's typing that in. I'm going to log off because I've got another training to do, but thank you all for being here and enjoy the rest of your day. Good luck with uh, school starting back up in the fall.